This is Trinity Storm and you are watching first part of What If Naruto Travel Back in Time to Save Uzumaki Clan. If you enjoy this video, please like, share and subscribe to the channel. Now wasting no more time, let's start the story. An elderly man sat on a small log in the middle of a forest deep within the Fire Country region. His beard was so long that it touched the ground. His head was bald, with a sliver of white hair down the back of his neck and an X-shaped scar on the front of his brow. This man was dressed in an orange trench coat with a black spiral on the back to indicate which clan he belonged to, as well as a black shirt and black pants. He was wearing shinobi sandals, shin guards, arm guards, and a large wooden staff that he used as a cane. In reality, it was much more than that. Who was this person in real life? What is his name? Naruto Uzumaki you'll accompany us, commanded a masked Anbu Shinobi wearing a Konoha headband, along with his team of 20 other identical figures emerging from the shadows. To further indicate who they all followed, the crest of the Uchiha clan was emblazoned on the sleeves of their arms. The figure, now identified as Uzumaki Naruto, seemed to stare at nothing while smoking from his pipe. The one that once belonged to the Sandame Hokage himself. And just what does your honorable Hokage for a Uchiha want with me? Naruto asked, his voice old but still strong. You banished the nine biju from this world. We've come to bring you back to Konoha, where you are hereby ordered to undo what you've done and reseal them in the hands of those chosen by Hokage-sama himself. You must create nine new Jinchuriki for Konoha to use in the escalating conflict with the other four shinobi villages that are rebelling against us, commanded the Anbu captain, who noticed Naruto blowing smoke from his mouth. My response, as it was the last time a team came to see me, remains the same. No, while the Anbu team suddenly drew their weapons, Naruto replied firmly. We have been given permission to use force to bring you back. Hokage-sama does not require your cooperation. All he needs is your knowledge of what you did and how to undo it, which he will obtain from your mind. One way or another, while Naruto sighed, he threatened the Anbu captain. I told Sasuke to leave me alone. I've told that jerk time and again to leave me alone. After everything I've lost, to let me live my life away from Konoha. After my dreams were taken away from me. But, like all Uchiha, he doesn't listen to others or try to think beyond his own desires or ambitions in his pursuit of more power. Karama was entirely correct. The cursed clan is the Uchiha clan. Similarly to how Konoha has become a cursed village, before putting the pipe away, Naruto remarked. You traitorous bastard! yelled an Anbu to the captain's right, motioning for him to calm down while keeping an eye on the old man in front of them. Naruto wasn't always this age. He had been forced to pay the price. When the Uzumaki summoned him and wanted to free the biju from being used as weapons again, the Shinigami told him that would be the cost. It had occurred shortly after the Fourth Shinobi War ended, and peace had been restored throughout the lands, and all was well at first. Until Sasuke was appointed as the seventh Hokage. Naruto couldn't become Hokage of Konoha because his mother was from the Uzumaki clan in Uzu and thus considered a foreigner when she arrived in the village. According to the law, no one with foreigner ancestry from another country or shinobi village could become Hokage. Only someone of such decadence three generations down could have such a right. Once that happened, they were considered pure-blooded Konoha citizens, and the possibility of betraying the village had been successfully bred out. It was a law enacted by the Sandame Hokage himself as the village's ruler when he was younger. He had made this rule, officially, as a precaution, in case Konoha's enemies tried to infiltrate the village as refugees, seduce some of its people, and then raise the children they had to usurp the village's power from within. To keep potential traders and sleeper agents from destroying the village once the next generation had reached adulthood. The Uzumaki clan had not been an exception to this rule. 
In fact, it appeared that the law was written specifically for them. That's why, despite being stronger than Minato in many ways, Kashina couldn't be Hokage. The man attempted to repeal the law, but the Sandame and Jiraiya were opposed, as were several other members of the council, despite Kashina's ranting at times about how unfair it was because she had been loyal to Konoha for years after joining their ranks following the fall of the Uzumaki clan during the Second Shinobi War. Of course, both Kaharu and Homura were adamant that this rule be followed when it came time to nominate who would succeed Tsunade as Hokage after Sasuke was pardoned for his past crimes. The two old bats went on and on about how Naruto couldn't be trusted to handle the numerous responsibilities that come with being Hokage. How Sasuke would take it seriously and led Konoha down a path deserving of the title. Naturally, Naruto felt betrayed, especially when Sasuke accepted it with a smirk on his face. As if the Uchiha had always known this would happen and was only now revealing his hand. But Naruto persevered. He didn't have the title of Hokage, but that didn't mean he couldn't have a family and children of his own who could one day take the hat. Tsunade apologized to him, and he accepted it because the woman had fought for his right to be Hokage throughout the nominations. It didn't matter because his lovely wife Hanada and their two children were his pride and joy in Konoha. Their love was healing his scarred heart and making him forget about the betrayal that had been delivered against him. Only to have his loving family taken from him by the hands of death. They were all killed on secret orders from Kaharu, Homura, Sasuke, and the Hyuga elders. Sasuke assigned Naruto to a diplomatic mission outside of Konoha to deal with some growing tensions near Earth Country. A mission from which Naruto was not supposed to return because it was a covert plan to end his life in order to remove him as a threat to the grand plan Sasuke wished to enact using the Nine Biju and his Sharingan. While Naruto was away on his mission, Sasuke directed his Anbu to kill Hanada at the request of the Hyuga elders, as well as her children, to ensure that none of Naruto's descendants would pose a future threat to the Uchiha's rule. Hanada, on the other hand, was not a meek woman to be crossed when it came to protecting her children, as evidenced by her killing nearly all of the Anbu attacking the house. She would have won had it not been for Sasuke appearing at the last moment and moving to kill her children with his Chidori, intent on a two-for-one kill. Hanada used her body as a shield to take the hit to the heart, but in her final act of strength, she struck Sasuke in various places, took one of his eyes, and even made the man sterile so he wouldn't have any progeny of his own to carry on his legacy. Enraged by what Hanada had done since she told him, Sasuke used what little strength he had left, as well as his remaining Anbu in the area, to burn down the Uzumaki house, killing the intended targets inside. Hanada had held her two terrified children close while they cried, assuring them that everything would be fine. That they were going to a lovely place where no one could ever hurt them again. When they asked if daddy would join them, Hanada could only smile and kiss their foreheads. Soon after, they were consumed by fire. When Naruto returned to Konoha, he was enraged beyond belief because the assassins sent to kill him on his mission. Konoha Nin all, were killed violently, and after torturing the group's leader, slowly, he now knew who sent them. When the blonde returned home, he discovered his house had been burned to the ground, with smoke still rising from the ashes. Naruto was walking through it when he noticed his wife and children holding hands. Naruto didn't understand how this could happen at first, but a burned message written in charred blood, Hanada's blood, burned into the wood of the floor told him everything he needed to know about who was responsible. Sasuke Uchiha Naruto wasted no time in kicking down the Hokage's office door. He noticed that Sasuke, the Hyuga elders, Homura, and Kaharu were all surprised to see Naruto alive and well. Yes, he was stained in blood, but it wasn't his blood. Many ninja in the tower tried to stop him from going to Sasuke's office, but he either killed or severely injured them. Naruto enraged them in the Anbu in the room before they could do or say anything. 
The first to perish were Homura and Kaharu. They were old and weak, so they were of no consequence, just as the Hyuga elders were, too old to move to defend themselves. But Sasuke was another story, and he deserved to suffer greatly at his hands. The Uchiha had been weakened by Hinata's attack, and Naruto was not going to give Sasuke a chance to win their fight. The fight spilled into the streets below, where Naruto proceeded to beat the living daylights out of Sasuke, calling him a traitor, coward, backstabber, power-hungry bastard, and murderer of his family. Despite everything, Sasuke smirked when Naruto referred to him as the final part, and the Uchiha mocked his former friend for showing mercy by asking the daimyos to pardon him. How he had taken everything from Naruto, and now the loser understood him like no one else could. How the darkness would now consume Naruto as it had always intended, and how the Uchiha would finally succeed in breaking in Uzumaki's will. Naruto, on the other hand, was not the type to snap, as Sasuke suspected. Instead, Naruto chose to take something else from Sasuke in order to level the playing field, and drew his sword from his mother's homeland. Before Sasuke could say or do anything, Naruto took his remaining eye, as well as his bandaged arm, which had been intended to replace his real one during the Fourth Shinobi War. Sasuke, you're nothing to me now. You are neither my brother nor my friend. You are my adversary. All of the shinobi who follow you are my adversaries. It makes no difference whether they were my friends or not. Any shinobi who comes after me in your name from now on is my enemy. And I'm going to kill them. You wanted me to break Sasuke, but I'm not breaking. I'm going to do what you're unable to do. Endure. I'm going to live, while you're going to die. The world will see how rotten you are and abandon you for good with this rotting village. Those were his final words to Sasuke before Naruto left with Kurama to ensure the Uchiha didn't use him for his own nefarious purposes. Just because Sasuke had lost his eyes didn't mean he couldn't use replacements for the same purpose. Despite what Sasuke had done, Naruto had become a wanted man throughout Konoha and Fire Country. All Konoha Nin now had standing orders to find and kill Naruto if he was found. But that wasn't the only thing. The other cages apparently heard what the Uchiha had done and refused to participate in what the Hokage was planning. They sealed off their borders and instructed Sasuke's shinobi to enter at their own risk, as Konoha was now their enemy. Enraged, Sasuke declared war on them all after being healed, calling each village a traitor to Konoha and declaring his to be the only true shinobi village of the elemental countries. How he was the supreme cage, ruling over all the other cages. He even declared that all shinobi villages and their cages must and will swear loyalty to him or be destroyed by his power. That they would bend the knee or he would break their backs before taking their own and their children's lives. As a result, the Fifth Shinobi War, also known as the Rebellion of the Four Cages by the people of Konoha, began. For the most part, Naruto stayed out of it. He required time to grieve the death of his wife and children. That all changed when the few remaining loyal spies in his network informed him of Sasuke's plan to win the war. To collect all nine biju using his replacement Sharingan eyes. To use the power of his dojutsu to subdue them and unleash enslaved biju on the four cages and their allies. Naruto, of course, could not let this happen. The biju had earned the right to live and be free of human enslavement. From being used in wars by power-hungry humans. From being viewed solely as tools, slaves, or weapons for personal gain in conquering the world. So Naruto did the only thing he could given the circumstances, he gathered the nine biju himself and sent them to a realm where humans couldn't use them. Where they might be safe free. Happy. Everything they were denied in life soon after the sage created them from the Jubi chakra sealed within his body. So Naruto visited each village. 
one at a time speaking with Biju about his strategy. How he wished to prevent Sasuke's plan from becoming a reality. How it was the only way in the future for Sasuke or any other human to be denied such ambitions. Each Biju reluctantly agreed with him, and eventually joined Naruto in the ruins of Uzu to perform the means to transport them to such a location. Of course, opening a portal to such a realm required a price to be paid to a deity capable of cutting a hole to such a place. And the only person Naruto could think of who could be summoned for such a task was the Shinigami. When the deity appeared in front of him, Naruto told the Shinigami what he desired and stated that he was willing to pay the price if it meant Sasuke's plans would fail. Despite his deathly appearance, the Shinigami seemed quite taken with the Uzumaki standing before him. As a result, the Shinigami did not take his soul as Naruto expected, but instead demanded something else in exchange. Something the Biju objected to because what was being asked was potentially worse. The Shinigami had demanded that the price for Naruto's overall success be his youth. That the Uzumaki be transformed into an elderly Uzumaki. Granted, he would still be strong, even by the standards of an elder Uzumaki, but he would have aged to the point of looking very old. To level the playing field, the Shinigami gave Naruto's sword a piece of its essence, causing it to bond with the man and become what the deity had referred to as a Zanpakuto. A tremendously powerful sword. Only Naruto could truly wield it. A sword with the potential to bring the entire world to its knees if fully unleashed. And with this incredible power comes an equally incredible understanding of how to use it against his enemies. Without hesitation, Naruto agreed to the Shinigami's terms and informed the other villages of what he had done to prevent Sasuke from carrying out his plans for the Biju. Sasuke was furious as hell after that. He had ordered Naruto's capture and return to Konoha to not only undo what he had done, but also to face Hokage's justice, as he put it. Naruto had been the most wanted man in Fire Country since then, but no one could track him down unless he wanted to be found. When they did, it was usually Konoha Shinobi, who had been sent by Sasuke to capture him, and they usually died slowly and painfully. None of Naruto's true friends were among those sent, including the rookies, Guy's old team, or the Konohamaru Corps. Tsunade and Shizun also left. Naruto's favorite ramen shop owners felt the same way. Even the rookies' senseis and their own children were sacrificed to ensure that the true will of fire was passed down to the next generation. They knew when to leave, and when they saw how corrupt Konoha had become under Sasuke's rule, they did. Only Sakura remained to support Sasuke's tyrannical rule, determined to cure Sasuke's sterility and one day have his child. Or at least she was determined. Until Naruto killed her on a C-ranked mission she was on and sent the woman's body in tiny pieces back to Sasuke. It's a good thing you're all idiots. It lightens the burden of killing you all on my heart, remarked Naruto before vanishing in a blur and reappearing one second later behind them. Soon after, the Anbu died as a result of being sliced to pieces. But this was insufficient for Naruto. No. This had to stop right now. Konoha had to be burned to the ground and its ashes scattered into the winds. While Naruto knew he was stronger than Sasuke would be for years to come, his body was still old, and whether you're Uzumaki or not, age catches up with you. Naruto was not going to be like Serutobi Hiruzen and allow this Uchiha version of Orochimaru to do whatever he pleased in the hopes of repenting later. The Uchiha had his chance for redemption and blew it. Only a small percentage of Konoha's population chose to change. A small minority as well. Smirking slightly, Naruto had an idea on how to solve this problem and put an end to this nonsense with Sasuke. It was dangerous, suicidal, and would ultimately lead to his death. But. He wouldn't be Uzumaki Naruto if that didn't perfectly fit his personality. 
A week later, Konoha minus 1. Konoha activated the alarm. Shinobi from the village flocked to the main gate, weapons drawn and chakra surging through them to use jutsus. They all looked at the figure who was the source of this action with a mixture of fear, apprehension, and anger. Not surprising given how many of their comrades were killed by this elderly man and the rumored power he wielded. Even if he didn't appear to be. Behind these Konoha shinobi came Sasuke, wearing his Hokage hat and robes with the Uchiha symbol on the back, as if to indicate that only a Uchiha could be Hokage. Not surprising given the Uchiha clan's affinity for fire and their belief that no one else could be Hokage due to that stipulation. So, after all this time in hiding, you finally decided to come out. Did you come to recognize my greatness? Have you come to beg forgiveness? To assist me in putting an end to the other cage's stupid rebellion? Sasuke smirked as he realized how old his former friend had become. No, Sasuke, on all counts. You are not deserving of my assistance, let alone recognition of your greatness. You are lower than garbage, Sasuke scowled at Naruto's response. Says the weak old man in front of me, who looks like a mere gust of wind could easily knock him over with little to no effort, countered Sasuke harshly as he noticed Naruto now sporting a smirk and chuckling. Now, Sasuke Teme. If there's one thing you should have learned by now, it's that you should never, ever underestimate a member of the Uzumaki clan. Especially since that Uzumaki happens to be M.E. Naruto's eyes abruptly changed from amusing to cold and icy. Restrain him. Commanded Sasuke, as his shinobi moved in to take Naruto down. Only to be struck by an invisible weight of pressure and see Naruto's hunched form straighten, with the look of a warrior replacing the friendly weak old man. Removing his coat, Naruto revealed his body was not that of a frail old man, as he had led others to believe, but of a hardened warrior of battle, complete with battle scars. His eyes were filled with rage, fire, and conviction, which Sasuke had never seen before in Naruto. Fools. You are following a phony cage. Sasuke believes he is superior to everyone else, and that everyone should be amazed at his feet as if he were a god. In reality, he would have you all burn to avoid my wrath, but I will not allow it. This village has become tainted. The will of fire has turned dark and hateful. It must be extinguished and removed from this world, Naruto said as his crude walking stick transformed into a sword and he grabbed the hilt. You pathetic loser. I'm not sure what you're about to do, but I'm not going to let it happen. Do you hear me? You're gonna die here. This is my world. Mine are its people. My perspective on the world as I see it is the law. In defiance, Sasuke yelled, wishing he could move his body to stop Naruto. Wrong. Your vision of the world is about to be destroyed. Ryujin Jaka, reduce all creation to ash. Naruto exclaimed before a seemingly unstoppable wave of fire exploded from his being and consumed everyone in its path. Specifically, his adversaries. None of them survived the assault. The fire consumed Konoha, the intense blade of it all destroying everything and everyone in the village. Some attempted to flee, but they were unable to do so because the buildings were easily destroyed by the intensity of the fire. Naruto was only getting started. With all his might, he made the fire spin violently in a circle over the entire village before splitting into four and diving into the earth below. Only to rise up in four different corners of the village and shoot up toward the heavens, his desire to leave nothing of the village visible in his actions. This place and everything around it were going to burn. The Hokage Monument would not be spared. It wasn't much of a monument anymore. Sasuke had removed the other Hokage heads and replaced them all with one massive head of himself to emphasize his greatness. 
to demonstrate to everyone that he was the greatest Hokage Konoha had ever had or needed in its history. Naruto considered it an insult and an eyesore. Don't be concerned, Hanada. My youngsters. I'm coming home, Naruto thought before closing his eyes and unleashing all his power on the village, causing a massive explosion. If Didera, the mad bomber of Iwa, had lived to see the outcome of Naruto's actions, he would have praised him as a god. Naruto, on the other hand, accepted his oblivion without hesitation. He has no reason to. His adversaries had vanished. The war that Sasuke had started had come to an end. Peace would be restored to the world. The remaining four cages would continue to rule their villages in his absence and, hopefully, would not try to kill each other anytime soon. Even so, it was no longer his problem. I wouldn't be too sure of that, my boy, the Shinigami said solemnly. I see. So you've come to reclaim the power you bestowed upon me, remarked Naruto, with the Shinigami chuckling. No, I am not, the Shinigami replied. Then why are you here? Naruto asked, the Shinigami looking almost exhausted. I need your assistance, dear boy. As you are aware, the world is not what it should be or has been for many years. In fact, the world as you have known it up to this point has been incorrect, Naruto looked surprised as he responded to the Shinigami. So my life, as I know it, was a blunder? Is that all? Inquired Naruto, the Shinigami shaking his head. No. This is not an error. Just. Wrong. For example, your mother's clan should not have been destroyed, Shinigami responded. Nonetheless, it was. No less than four of the five shinobi villages, Naruto remarked, the Shinigami shaking its head. It's not four. Five. All five shinobi villages were involved. Konoha is among them, Naruto looked shocked and horrified as the Shinigami replied. What? murmured Naruto as the Shinigami nodded. Sarutobi Hiruzen feared for Konoha's future after becoming Hokage. He was aware of the Uzumaki clan's growing power. In charge. It was only a matter of time before the clan that had allied with Konoha became its own entity. And, because members of the Uzumaki clan are the only ones capable of wielding Kayubi, he felt they needed to be crippled to prevent them from ever gaining such power, while Naruto was enraged, said the Shinigami. Who else was a part of that decision? Who else was aware of the truth? Though Naruto had a good idea on most, if not all of them, he asked. Of course, Hiruzen's former teammates. Shimura Danzo, his former rival. Orochimaru assisted in determining where to strike and Jiraiya, go get your mother for the transfer of the Kayubi from Mito to her, while Naruto was once again floored, the Shinigami responded. Was Jiraiya involved? I could see Orochimaru, Danzo and the other two Cretans. But what about Jiraiya? Questioned Naruto as he felt his bond with the Sanin Frey. He assisted in the deactivation of security and trap seals that would have destroyed the advanced enemy attack force. He also used his spy network to leak the secret passages through which the enemy ninja could sneak into the village and carry out the pincer attack that Orochimaru helped devise. He was confident that the one Uzumaki had obtained from the clan could easily perform Fuenjutsu. In fact, Mito left a wealth of knowledge for your mother to learn from after she arrived. Hiruzen was aware of this and made certain that Kashina would put her newly acquired skills to good use for Konoha's benefit. Didn't you find it strange that both Hiruzen and his student were aware of your clan, your mother, and what they were capable of? But they never once made certain that you were taught those same skills? Naruto's face contorted in rage as the Shinigami explained. What should I do? 
You clearly have some ideas on how to fix things so that my life does not repeat itself, Naruto responded with a Shinigami nod. Naruto, I'll send you back in time. Before you were even born. It was during the Second Shinobi War. You will change events so that your clan does not fall and Konoha, as you know, does not behave as it did, Shinigami responded. And what happens if I do something that alters time and obliterates me? Do you mind if I crush Konoha if I so desire? Shinigami shakes his head as Naruto questions him. No. The first part will not take place. You will be returned, but not as Naruto Uzumaki. You will be returned as another member of the Uzumaki clan. As for the village that assisted in your betrayal, do as you see fit unless I tell you otherwise, Naruto raised an eyebrow at the Shinigami in response. So I travel back in time as myself, but not as myself, in order to avoid destroying myself in the distant future. Is that right? Naruto inquired, the Shinigami nodding. Yes. With the right changes to the timeline, your future self will grow up strong, educated, and most importantly, with a family who will love you no matter what Naruto nodded as he replied to the Shinigami. I don't think it's too much to ask for a much younger body. While I am no slouch in this form, I would prefer to live long enough to witness my own birth, Naruto responded with a Shinigami chuckle. I can restore your energy so you can live longer, but your current form remains unchanged. After all, I believe you would find it amusing to see grown men barely a third your current age unable to defeat you in a fight, Shinigami remarked, with Naruto considering it before nodding. Well. Not he's wrong, thought Naruto before the deity restored his energy, making the elderly Uzumaki feel stronger in the process. It's finally time. You will no longer be Uzumaki Naruto when you awaken in the world of the living. He does not yet exist. Uzumaki Yamamoto Genrisei Shigakuni you will be. Naruto's sweat dropped as he heard the Shinigami's long-ass name. Why don't you just call me Uzumaki Yamamoto? Asked Naruto, with the Shinigami chuckling and showing his face did look a little sheepish. Yes, I suppose it's a little. Long, the Shinigami observed, while Naruto sighed slightly at the deity. I'm prepared. Let's get this over with, shall we? Naruto spoke impatiently. Even as an old man, you still act impatient, the Shinigami observed. My name is Uzumaki. What did you anticipate? Naruto countered with a small huff. Indeed, the Shinigami said before opening the portal for old Uzumaki to enter. It was time to change the course of history as he knew it. For the better. It was an eye-opening experience for him to witness his mother's homeland at its peak of power during the Second Shinobi War. He saw his Uzumaki kin walking around, happy, healthy, full of life, and generally happy. A far cry from what would happen to them in Uzu if he did not intervene in the coming months. The Second Shinobi War was heating up, Iwa was on the move, and Kumo was right there with them. Suna and Kiri were also indicating their intentions, but the time-traveling Uzumaki knew they would all converge on Uzu at the last possible moment. If the Shinigami's revelation about what the Sanin did in selling out the Uzumaki clan during this time period was any indication, the elderly man suspected Jiraiya and his Kami-damned spy network had a hand in it. All of the misfortunes that befell the Uzumaki clan occurred quickly after Serutobi Hiruzen became the Sandame Hokage. That was several years ago, and there were clear signs of tension between Uzu and Konoha shortly after his reign. It's not surprising. We wanted Mito to be present for the resealing of Kurama into a new host, but they refused. This is a security risk, as stated. That's a zeal weakening. Bah. If they were truly concerned, they would have let us sneak her out of Konoha while using Aero Spy Senen's network to misdirect the other villages. Instead, 
They had demanded we send one of our clan to Konoha for the resealing. The only reason I allowed this to happen was so my mother could hold Kurama and one day meet my father, thought one Uzumaki Yamamoto, who had also been called Uzumaki Naruto at one point in his life. But, unlike before, this time he was a true full-blooded Uzumaki with all the skills that a person his age possessed. As it turned out, an Uzumaki clan member named Uzumaki Yamamoto, insert super long ass name here, had been presumed dead for years between the first and second shinobi wars. Nobody knew whether it was due to old age or a vengeful shinobi from rival villages. Of course, when Naruto, or Yamamoto, appeared on the clan's doorstep, many were skeptical and wondered where he had been all this time. Yamamoto easily explained how he had gone into seclusion in order to embark on a spiritual journey of enlightenment. The fact that he didn't contact them was due to him losing track of time, and the old Uzumaki humbly apologized for it. He said, I got lost on the road of spiritual life. My bad. Before giving a hearty Uzumaki chuckle, much to the heavy sweat dropping and face planted reactions of his kin. Following that event, Uzumaki Yamamoto was reintegrated into the clan and was regarded as a key advisor to the Uzumaki clan head. Many people suggested he take over as clan head because he was the oldest, if not the strongest, Uzumaki around, but Yamamoto told them it wasn't for him and that he trusted the current clan head to do the right thing. Hey, old man! exclaimed a redhead girl, smiling as she ran up to Yamamoto. Hello Kashina-chan, how are you? Yamamoto inquired, finding it amusing to see his mother in this light. Since the last time he saw her, she had grown up and was not afraid to hit him over the head for being rude. I'm fine. Better than you, I bet with your old bones, Kashina joked. Yamamoto delivers a tick mark and a punch to the girl's red-haired head. My bones may be old, but they haven't lost any of their strength. Exclaimed an irritated Yamamoto before realizing what he had done. He just hit his former mother on the head. For a brief moment, he worried about what would happen if Kashina discovered that her future son, who had traveled back in time, had hit her on the head as a child and was calling him old. Fortunately, he shrugged it off because he doubted she'd ever find out, and no one alive could tell her the truth. Aside from himself. Which he had no intention of doing. Ow. Mean old Yama exclaimed Kashina, glaring at him. Snippy little tomato head. Countered Yamamoto, as Kashina's glare became more intense. You take that back. I am not a tomato head. Kashina exclaimed as he pointed at him. No, I won't. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to go. Bye for now, tomato-chan. Replied Yamamoto ignoring the angry scream from the girl who would one day be Uzumaki Naruto's mother. And set in motion the reason why, after the first time an academy student said it, no one in Konoha dared to call her a tomato. Sometime later Uzu Tower. Jiraiya from Konoha and a team of assigned Anbu are coming here tomorrow at the Hokage's request to inspect the seals surrounding the key defensive sections of Uzu, said Uzumaki Garp, who felt Yamamoto should be aware of this and hear his thoughts. Not surprising given their growing dislike for Konoha. Everything was fine when Hashirama and Tobarama were alive with the Hokage hat on their heads. Mito had written back home about Konoha and how much she enjoyed it, and the two had formed strong bonds. But, since Hiruzen took power, the letters had become less frequent, and it was clear that the elderly woman no longer cared about the village as much as she did when her husband was alive. When the question of transferring Kayubi to another Uzumaki arose, Konoha had effectively declared the biju their property, and thus theirs regardless of whether the only person capable of holding the fox was an Uzumaki. Garp nearly collided with the young Hokage and was restrained by four of his own Anbu. Hiruzen's expression was unreadable, but the Uzumaki clan head could see through his stone-faced facade. 
In fact, Garp had been wondering why Mito wasn't at the meeting, and he suspected it was because the woman's sensory abilities had detected the true intentions of the Sandame Hokage. Garp knew Mito loved her late husband and brother-in-law, but the Uzumaki clan always put blood relatives first. As a result, Garp believed Mito would have the final say if she were present, and he would have supported her clan over Konoha if only to ensure that things were done properly in Uzu by the most skilled Fuenjutsu masters. They also want to take Kashina to Konoha to transfer Mito's Kayubi into her, Yamamoto added, frowning. While I dislike the idea of using Kashina in this manner, we must be realistic that it is necessary in order to keep the Biju out of the hands of those who would abuse such power. Though given how Konoha has the Uchiha clan, I'm inclined to fight them on this. Mito is in her twilight years. She deserves to be buried here following the transfer. Not there. I don't care if Senju Hashirama was her husband. But Hiruzen has the majority of the cards. We have the seal masters and the body for the transfer. They currently have the biju and are playing on our clan's honor to give in to all of their demands. That we won't allow Mito to die and Konoha to perish while using our clan's beliefs against us, Yamamoto said, while Garp frowned even more. It's truly sickening to think Hashirama's own students would stoop so low to keep the biju in Konoha. I can see Homura and Kaharu doing this. They both had a twinkle in their eyes at the idea of having a young Jinchuriki from our clan for them to mold to their own benefit. Even that emotion banning Twit Danzo is clearly frothing mentally at the mouth to have Kashina in Konoha as the. I'll keep an eye on them. Anything Jiraiya and the Anbu do to the seals, I can easily fix, and even improve if possible, Yamamoto replied, as Garp nodded. Your suspicions about Konoha are becoming more accurate, my friend. We both know that if anything happens to our clan during this war, Kashina will be stuck in Konoha, and will have to face being disliked because he is considered a foreigner in their eyes. A new concept that has been growing steadily since Hiruzen took office as Hokage, and one he has yet to suppress if Mito's last letter is any indication, said Garp. I was under the impression poor Mito was getting too old and weak to send us any more letters? Yamamoto asked, shaking his head. No. That's what she wanted others in Konoha to believe, especially her doctors, who were appointed to her by Hiruzen. Remember when she warned me of this slowly happening to her in one of her previous letters she sent? And you suspected it was more than that? I replied back to her and left a coded message in my letter to fake being weak to fool the doctors and medic nins so she could write back to us one day about what was happening in Konoha. Danzo, Hiruzen, and Jiraiya are all conspiring against the Uzumaki clan to gain complete control over the future Kayubi Jinchuriki, and not just Kashina, but anyone who follows her after being in Konoha, Yamamoto speculated, with Garp nodding. Jiraiya has only recently been declared a master of Fuenjutsu, though that's putting it mildly because he's not quite up to our level, but his skills are just enough that he could effectively seal a lesser biju into a body to make a Jinchuriki, and with enough time and effort on his part, I'm sure Jiraiya could even use his knowledge of Fuenjutsu to seal the Kayubi into another Uzum. The act of trying to seal the Kayubi into someone would kill him. Even if the said person chosen was an Uzumaki, the man does not strike me as someone who would train the one who will and mooch off of said student's memory. All to make women swoon and get them into his bed, Yamamoto said, knowing Jiraiya did that during his three-year training trip to get the women to remotely consider H. Mito also warned me about the snake's slowly growing cruel mentality, as she called it, and to be just as cautious around the friends of the idiot monkey, Garp added, while Yamamoto was reminded of Orochimaru and Hiruzen's two teammates. He was excited to murder them all again. And indeed we will, but first we must deal with the poisonous toad and his little escort entering our homeland. Once that is resolved, and Kashina is the new Jinchuriki of Kayubi, she should be allowed to return home to be here with us to give her seal a proper inspection from time to time. 
This is something we should strongly insist on to Jiraiya when he comes here to let him know Kashina will always be one of us first and foremost. Agreed on all counts, my friend, Garp replied, nodding and exiting the room. He needed to get some work done. Uzu the following day. Jiraiya knew his presence, let alone the Anbu with him, would be unwelcome in Uzu, but this was ridiculous. The man entered the secret passage with an armed escort of ten Uzu Anbu and had the distinct impression that these guys would kill him and his team if the Uzumaki clan head had not given the orders. Tensions had been building for some time, so Jiraiya could almost understand the need for such security, but the man also found it insulting that Uzu would act in this manner, especially toward him. Sandame Hokage himself as a student. Of course, if the Uzumaki clan ever realized what one of the main and true reasons they were here today, one could argue that the people of Uzu were not at fault. The problem was that Hiruzen had given the order to protect Kashina while also ensuring that she was one of the few Uzumaki left in the clan after the war. Jiraiya did not question his sensei or Hokage about the matter. In fact, he agreed with the man because Uzu was becoming well-known and powerful in their own right. It wasn't long before they were recognized as their own shinobi village. Minor village for the time being, given that it was all clan members, but in the future? Who knows for sure? They could grow into the sixth major shinobi village. That was not what anyone wanted. When it came to major villages, Hiruzen thought six was too many. The cutoff point was five village, and the Uzumaki clan had no business adding or even attempting to add themselves to the mix. Konoha had reached the point where it needed to cut its losses. They already had Kayubi, but they needed a new vessel. The Uzumaki clan had the new vessel as well as the sealing ability to ensure that the biju was safely placed in the new vessel. The issue was that the Uzumaki clan would ensure that the seal was designed to contain the biju but not to unleash its power. Hiruzen and Jiraiya both frowned at that last part. Why should they when the other villages were not? Jiraiya was one of the reasons he was here. Not only did he want to secure Kashina, but he also wanted to see some of their work on Fuenjutsu so he could figure out how to change the seal placed on Kashina in the future to unleash the Kayubi's power on Iwa or Kumo. He was well aware that the Uzumaki clan would frown upon this if they learned of his intentions to abuse Fuenjutsu. Fortunately, Konoha and Jiraiya wouldn't have to deal with such moral irritants from the Uzumaki clan again soon after they left here with their prize. Garp-sama your welcoming party isn't what it used to be. Jiraiya exclaimed happily to Garp in his usual, laid and carefree back, manner. Normally, you'd be correct, but we're at war, Jiraiya, and one can never be too careful in these dark times, said Garp, who would have been more welcoming of Jiraiya if it hadn't been for the things he felt were off about the man's presence. True. Very true. I know we're being a pain in the ass, so I'll keep my visit brief and to the point so we can get out of your red slightly graying hair," Jiraiya replied casually, as if he wasn't offended. Yes, you are here for one of my kin to bring to Konoha for the transfer of Kayubi. I still think you should have brought Mido here instead of Kashina," Garp said angrily, while Jiraiya shrugged. Too risky. My spy network told me that a lot of shinobi activity from the other villages is being made throughout the different countries right now. Mito was Hashirama's wife and is still a prime target, age notwithstanding, Jiraiya replied, as Garp's eyes narrowed. She is an Uzumaki, and we protect our own. Besides, Mito may be old, but I'm sure she could whip your butt in a fight. Not to mention, you got here safely enough with your own Anbu without incident. Why would it be any different if Mito was here now? Garp challenged, while Jiraiya looked sheepish. Well. I hadn't thought of that, but as they say, better safe than sorry, and Mito is much safer in Konoha right now with an entire village protecting her under the Sandame Hokage's watch, Jiraiya replied, Garp narrowing his eyes even more. 
I'd rather trust a fresh out of the Academy made Genin for an Uzumaki than an entire Konoha Anbu platoon, Garp thought to himself before the man grunted and motioned Jiraiya and his Anbu to follow him. All the while, they were mistaking an old man's narrowed eyes for an Uzumaki with a long beard sitting down with a walking staff, watching them every step of the way. Uzu three days later. Are you sure this information is reliable? Asked an Iwa shinobi, looking over at the Kumo Anbu captain leading this allied assault on Uzu. My sources say it is. Look. Here is the entrance, just as the spy said. Unguarded and the seals have been disabled, the Kumo Anbu replied, looking at the Kiri and Suna Shinobi and their group. This is too simple. Who gave your cage this information? Wondered the Kiri Shinobi, who wasn't convinced that this plan would go off without a hitch. Even if I told you, you wouldn't believe me, and in some ways, I don't think you even want to know, replied the Kumo Anbu, who didn't want to believe it either. I find it difficult to believe the Uzumaki clan would be so lax in their security, or that one of their own would betray them, remarked Asuna Shinobi with a scar running diagonally from his eye to his lip. I never said it was Uzu, the Kumo Anbu remarked cryptically as he and the others moved silently through the tunnel that would lead them into the heart of Uzu while the main force attacked from the outside. Before they could continue their silent conversation, the ground beneath them began to glow with seals, and the entire allied ninja squad was impaled with earth spikes. Some were able to get out of the way in time by pressing against the ceiling with chakra, but they were quickly fried when seals appeared and were hit with an intense blast of lightning that turned their bodies to ashes. Those who remained were attempting to retreat from where they had entered, only to find the path blocked and a new wall appearing at their back. Following that, more seals appeared all around them, and the now smaller area in which these allied shinobi were contained began to quickly fill with water. With piranhas in it. There were, of course, no survivors. Uzu at the moment walls. Bodies were strewn about. There are a lot of people. Kiri, Suna, Kumo, and Iwa shinobi were all on the ground. Dead. Well. Dead or dying soon. They were told that an infiltration team would assist them in a pincer movement that would allow them to take down Uzu on two fronts. How the seals on the walls connected to traps and early warning detection had been disabled without the Uzumaki clan noticing a few days earlier. They didn't know how that happened, or perhaps the smarter than average shinobi of this allied force didn't want to know. The point was, they had been virtually assured of victory and were eager to seize it. Only to discover that their eagerness to believe in something certain, even from their own cages when given this assignment, would ultimately be their undoing. How could this have occurred? How could we have failed? Were our cages betraying us? Did they truly turn against us? Or did one of them betray the other to the Uzumaki clan without even realizing it, pondered a dying Suna Junin as he crawled away from the bodies around him in a futile attempt to report back to the case cage of their staggering loss. Only to have a sword pierce his neck and exit his throat. Reduce all creation to ash, Ryujin Jaka. Cried an elderly voice as the body on the ground and those around him burned in flames. And the only person who escaped unscathed was the one who started the fire. One week later in Konoha. You assured me the seals were disabled, Jiraiya, and you and your entire team I sent to get Kashina were ordered to disable the seals around Uzu without anyone knowing the truth. The mission was a success sensei. Those were your words Jiraiya when I asked about it, Hiruzen said angrily to Jiraiya, while Orochimaru, Homura, Kaharu, and Danzo were in the room with disappointed expressions. I did. I made certain of it. Besides, if you want to pass along blame here, why not blame the Temei? He was the one who suggested the secret tunnel I used to get into Uzu when I was there for the enemy to enter undetected when the allied army attacked. Protested Jiraiya, pointing at Orochimaru, 
who frowned because he did come up with the idea and the plan to perform the pincer movement accordingly. And it would have worked if Jiraiya's end of things had gone smoothly. That it didn't. My end would have worked if you had done your job, Baka. Now the Uzumaki clan is suspicious of us. They send a letter demanding not only how the enemy knew of the tunnel used, but why some of their seals were noticeably damaged if not disabled. Not to mention the damage they saw was fresh and looked like it was days old when they began repairing it. The fact you were on Uzu the day such a thing happened to their seals makes us all look like traitors too. Considering what we did or attempted to do to the Uzumaki clan, isn't it true? Jiraiya asked, with Hiruzen and the others frowning. That's not the point, Jiraiya. With the Uzumaki clan scattered, no one would have been able to piece it all together on their end. We could have easily picked up the survivors to bring them to us and be reorganized as a clan of this village we could easily control. At least in terms of using one of them to hold the Kaiubi. We could also learn how to use Fuinjutsu on a level like them and they are not needed so much, here. Yeah, it didn't work out, but it wasn't my fault. I was careful, and so was the Anbu team with me. Though maybe if the members of Root hadn't been there, the Uzumaki clan wouldn't have known, Jiraiya said, with Danzo frowning. And what does Root have to do with your incompetence? Danzo frowned. I don't know, maybe it's because those trained in your program have the emotional stability of a wet dishcloth. The Uzumaki clan has a lot of skilled sensors, who can sense people's emotions. Mito was one of them, remember? The ones in Uzu no doubt sensed how emotionless some of the Anbu in my escort were with me and made it known to Uzumaki Garp. Chances are he had some members of the clan snoop. Emotions are a weakness, Jiraiya. My root shinobi did their job according to the instructions given to them, and I highly doubt they are the reasons for your failure, Danzo countered, with Jiraiya frowning at him. One day you'll die an old man, old and alone, Jiraiya remarked, with Danzo not even flinching at the alleged insult. Considering how you live or intend to live in the future, Jiraiya, Danzo countered, with Jiraiya smirking. Fine with me. The world would probably suck by that point anyway, Jiraiya replied. Enough. Both of you. We need to figure out how to stop this from making us look like we betrayed our own allies. Thoughts? Asked Hiruzen as the room fell silent for a moment. They can't actually prove Jiraiya and his team damaged the seals after all the fighting sensei. The seals could have been damaged during the attempt to invade Uzu, not Jiraiya, Orochimaru said, while Hiruzen nodded. And the secret entrance? Hiruzen inquired, noting that this was a separate issue. We say the enemy found it while looking for a way to get into Uzu from behind while the main force obviously attacked from the front, and they foolishly entered a well-hidden entrance made to be a secret trap and died as a result. Not our fault the enemy found the damn place and entered believing it was unguarded in some shape or form, Jiraiya added, with Hiruzen nodding in agreement. The fact that the Uzumaki clan would make such claims of us betraying them is an insult to Konoha and to you, Hokage-sama, Kaharu added, knowing they could spin it so that the Uzumaki clan appeared paranoid. Even if the clan had been correct. Even so, accusations have a way of clinging to things, much like a bad stench on clothing. You can scrub and clean the clothing all you want, but the bad stench will still remain, if only in memory, Homura remarked making sure they understood this accusation made by the Uzumaki clan would not go away easily no matter how hard Konoha tried to spin it. I get it. We're going to look like the bad guys here for a while until this mess blows over. No big deal. We have Kashina, Mito will be ready to transfer the Kaiubi into her soon, and that will be the end of it. I'm already thinking of different seals we could create for future Jinchuriki beyond Kashina so we have our future weapon once it's time for her to pass on the fox to another one. Hopefully an Uzumaki born. 
It's not that simple, Jiraiya, Hiruzen replied as Jiraiya frowned. What do you mean it's not that simple? Jiraiya asked, as Hiruzen sighed. When they did their investigation on the issue, the Uzumaki clan was not happy. They are considering breaking off all ties to Konoha. That means taking back all of the members of the Uzumaki clan, including Jinchuriki. That means we lose both Kashina and Kayubi in one single stroke, Hiruzen explained while Jiraiya and the others looked angry. They can't. We need a Jinchuriki in Konoha. They can't take Mito or Kashina from us, especially now during a war. Jiraiya protested, while Orochimaru sighed. Maybe not now, Jiraiya, but most likely after the war is over. Mito will most likely die prior to the end of the war or shortly after depending on how much longer this will last. Depending on the aftermath of the war, Kashina may be recalled back to Uzu where she can continue to be in Uzumaki on their terms, and not ours, as we first intended, said Orochimaru, knowing the Uzumaki clan would wait until the war. Fortunately, it may not come to that. Uzumaki Garp added in his letter that he is willing with great reluctance to let this suspicion slide if we allow another one of their older members to live in Konoha. A precautionary measure, he says, and goes on to claim that refusing us now would only give the Uzumaki clan more reason to take both Mito and Kashina back to Uzu. Not to mention everything that the Uzumaki. So it's basically an ultimatum, not a request. Let the Uzumaki clan come to Konoha or they take everything the Uzumaki clan gave us to make Konoha and leave us to fend for ourselves, Jiraiya observed, with Hiruzen nodding. Ridiculous. What right do those islanders have to issue this demand to us? Exclaimed Kaharu angrily. To be fair, Kaharu-san, if the roles were reversed, we would have made the exact same demand, Jiraiya said, Danzo scowling. Irrelevant. Konoha is the only village that matters. Not Iwa, Suna, Kumo, Kiri, and most certainly not some island filled with Fuenjutsu users who call themselves a clan. I don't care if they are the Senju's cousin clan. They are a constant threat and as such should be eliminated before they have a chance to do anything to us in return," Danzo said, believing that anything not born, made, are created in Konoha. Well, we can't now. They're probably going to strengthen their defenses and keep their guard up around anyone sent to Uzu for any reason, Homura said, as the others grumbled about how their plan had been ruined. Aside from that, suppose we agree to let this Uzumaki clan member join Konoha. What does he or she contribute to this, and what is his or her name? Jiraiya inquired, while the Hokage simply sighed and rubbed his chin. Hiruzen, his name is Uzumaki Yamamoto, and he is arguably the oldest and most powerful Uzumaki clan member they have, Hiruzen replied, as Danzo, Orochimaru, Homura, and Kaharu stiffened in fear. Uzumaki Yamamoto? As in the Uzumaki Yamamoto? But. Supposed he's to be dead. Or rather. Reported to be dead. Exclaimed Kaharu, who had seen the man as a child and his power unleashed. Even the strength of Uchiha Madara paled in comparison to that of Uzumaki. In fact, Kaharu suspected that even if Madara and Hashirama worked together, it wouldn't be enough to defeat that man. Yes, I thought so, too, Hiruzen replied, while the others in the room looked nervous. Yamamoto is not only alive, but is considered stronger than before. He returned to Uzu sometime just before Jiraiya arrived for Kashina and has expressed an interest in seeing Konoha again. Wait. If this guy is the strongest Uzumaki in the clan right now, why isn't he the clan head instead of Garp? Jiraiya wondered, because the strongest clan member should rule. Because, for one thing, they also assumed he was dead until a short time ago. And, second, the man didn't want to lead the clan after returning. 
Instead, he has been consulting Garp at times since his return. I suspect Yamamoto-sama has the same distrust for us as Garp now does, Hiruzen replied, as the others in the room winced. So he's that powerful? Jiraiya asked, hissing at his teammate. Honestly Jiraiya, where were you when they were teaching our class history at the Ninja Academy? It was said the man could literally personify the will of fire that Hashirama preached about. He was given the nickname, Uzu's Fire. For a reason. Not even Madara or Hashirama could hope to match him in battle either separately or together, Orochimaru said, while Jiraiya looked nervous. Despite the fact that Madara went insane and left, he and Hashirama were considered the pride of Konoha. Anyone who could even come close to matching either of them was a truly monstrous individual. Which is all the more reason we can't say no. Besides, Kashina already has some kind of connection to him. If we refuse to let Yamamoto come to Konoha, it might inspire the man to take drastic measures to get the point across that saying no isn't an option. At this stage of the war, saying no to such a person is most unwise. No matter how much I want to say no, Hiruzen replied, with the others in the room. When is he expected to arrive? Danzo inquired in order to place some root anbu on the man for surveillance purposes. Tomorrow morning, Hiruzen replied, seeing Danzo's frown deepen. Tomorrow morning? So soon? Questioned Orochimaru, given that the letter had only been received today. Like I said, Yamamoto has little affection for Konoha, and no doubt he wants to get here quickly enough to ensure Kashina isn't corrupted by our village, Hiruzen explained as Homura and Kaharu frowned. He should have restricted movement throughout Konoha, Kaharu observed, while Homura nodded. And if I issue that command to him, who here is going to help me enforce it? Will you Kaharu? What about you Homura? Danzo? Orochimaru, are you interested in enforcing such a command and making Yamamoto see things our way through the use of force? Hiruzen asked, while everyone else in the room remained silent. It's nice to know everyone in this room is a coward like me when it comes to this guy, Jiraiya thought as he kept his mouth shut. We'll figure out how to deal with Yamamoto-sama when he arrives tomorrow, but in the meantime, we need to focus on the academy and where to place Kashina. Tsunade is currently with her right now, unknowingly helping us get the girl on our side like I originally hoped, Hiruzen said, with Jiraiya brushing his chin. I've been keeping an eye on the academy for a while now, and I think we should put her in the class with those her age group. There are quite a few clan heirs in one of them, if I recall this year's starting class correctly, right? Put Kashina in the same class with them. Offered Jiraiya with Homura and Kaharu looking at him as if he just said that all Jinchuriki should be loved if not respected. What? With the clan heirs? With Kashina? Inquired Homura, believing that such a thing should not happen because the girl was Konoha's future Jinchuriki and weapon. Why not? We need Kashina to like Konoha in order for her to stay here in the future, right? Not to mention she is from a clan. Maybe not a clan heir, but from an important clan in relation to the Senju. Plus, we need her to interact with the kids her age so she wants to actually stay in Konoha because of them when they are all grown up. She enrolls in the academy, makes friends with those in the class, and grows up as. There's just one problem, Jiraiya, with the seal altering. Yamamoto-sama is a master Fuenjutsu user. What makes you think he'll even let you get within three feet of Kashina to inspect her seal, let alone alter it to your specifications? Danzo asked, while Jiraiya simply shrugged. Easy. Time. Sensei said it himself. He's an old man. Sure, Yamamoto is strong for his age, but he won't live forever. Chances are, he'll die sometime within the next five years of old age. 
We just pretend to be on our best behavior until that time, and after the old geezer kicks the bucket, we lure Kashina into our confidence, and make up some reason for me to see her seal, replied Jiraiya. Good idea. I'll arrange for Kashina to be in the academy class appropriate for her age. She has some ninja training, so I imagine there's no real risk of her falling behind when she first starts out at the academy, Hirazan added, knowing this would be a good opportunity to influence Kashina despite possible interference from Mito and Yamamoto. Konoha the following day. When he saw Konoha, Uzumaki Yamamoto huffed. His eyes gazing up at the sight of the Hokage monument sporting the heads of Senju Hashirama and Tobarama. Both great in terms of being Hokage, but their personal choices in students, and successor to being the Hokage left much to be desired. Serutobi Hirazan's own face had recently been placed on the monument, but the sight of it made Yamamoto angry at what he had learned in his previous life as Uzumaki Naruto. He used to admire that man for his courage and honesty in doing what was right. Bah. He was no more righteous than Danzo and only marginally more ethical than Orochimaru. At least he was honest about himself and didn't try to hide who he was or how he felt about his personality from the rest of the world. They would soon receive their second punishment for past and future sins. Welcome back to Konoha, Yamamoto-sama. Do you want to rest for a while? Such a long walk from Uzu must have been exhausting, Hirazan offered diplomatically as he went to personally greet the much older looking man. And got a fist to the top of his head from a much older man with a tick mark on his bald and scarred brow. Impudent whelp. No manners whatsoever. Implying I am too old to travel long distances and saying I should rest upon arrival in subtle words. Hashirama should have taught you better manners brat!" exclaimed Yamamoto, discovering one of the benefits of being the elder and strong at the same time was being able to smack around just about anyone who made such a remark about your age. Whether you use subtle or not. Many of the Anbu assigned to guard the Hokage were sweating profusely as they saw their Hokage on the ground with a massive lump on his head. Yamamoto's body made a deep impact crater as a result of the force of the punch, demonstrating that he was indeed strong for his age. Damn the Uzumaki clan and their legendary temper. Now I see where Tsunade got hers as a kid, Hirazan thought as he emerged from the crater and noticed Yamamoto staring at him with unimpressed eyes. I expected more from you Hirazan. You've already been the Hokage and it's clearly made you soft in terms of taking a light hit. And to think it's only been a short time since Tobarama died in this war prior to naming you his successor. Perhaps Mito should have taken over and we wouldn't have to worry about such things, Yamamoto commented, mentally happy to see Hirazan was clearly seething at the idea of Mito sitting in the Hokage seat. Or, for that matter, any Uzumaki. There will be no Uzumaki trash in the Hokage seat. Not while I can be sure of it. Hirazan thought as he rose from the ground. Now, if you would escort me to Kashina and Mito, I would very much like to see my two precious kin, who must endure future hardship for the good of all, Yamamoto said, with Hirazan fixing his robes and cleaning them. Of course, Hirazan replied, but first, we need to go to the Hokage Tower to speak to councils and clan heads about your position here in the village, Yamamoto huffed, but nodded nonetheless. Very well but this meeting will be brief. I always find that longer than usual meetings are unnecessary, Yamamoto said before walking ahead of Hirazan, who glared at the older man's back and moved to catch up with him. Long story short, Hirazan had a feeling this meeting would not be as pleasant for him as he had hoped. The Hokage Tower Welcome to Konoha after so many years, Yamamoto-sama, Kaharu said politely, seeing the man in person after so long. She could feel the power coursing through him even now and shivered mentally in fear. Indeed, it has been many years, not since near the end of the first shinobi war, Homura added, while Yamamoto looked at the two with discontent. And I can only assume my return from presumed death shocks you greatly? 
Yamamoto asked, his eyes narrowing at the nervous shinobi council members. Considering we all thought you were dead, it's not unreasonable, Danzo replied, his voice as polite as dried flaky paint. Says the man who sees human emotions as a weakness. Your social skills, Danzo, Yamamoto remarked with a huff, seeing Danzo scowl even more. As do your own, it appears, if you're going to insult someone of high standing like myself in Konoha, Danzo replied. My apologies. I simply find it difficult to respect or be remotely polite to anyone who sees everyone around him as an expendable tool to be discarded when they are no longer of military use, Yamamoto countered sharply, noticing Danzo fighting back a sneer. You old fool. I would kill him right now if it weren't for the fact that he could kill us all with no effort. Danzo thought, keeping his emotions in check. In any case, we're glad you're here and have arranged for lodgings at an apartment complex in Konoha's South District, a civilian council member said. An apartment? In the South District? Yamamoto inquired, remembering it from his days as Uzumaki Naruto. When he lived there in the future, the apartment was a shithole in the heart of what many considered the Red Light District. Will that be a problem? Hiruzen asked as Yamamoto narrowed his eyes. I would prefer to stay with both Mito and Kashina at the Senju clan home as a guest of Tsunade. After all, the Senju and Uzumaki clans are distant family, Yamamoto replied, his face tense. Oh. Well, uh. Kashina isn't. Uh. Not she's staying with Mito, Hiruzen said nervously, while Yamamoto looked disappointed. What? exclaimed Yamamoto. I wanted to take Kashina in Yamamoto-sama, but Sensei said it wouldn't be a good idea. He has her staying in an apartment complex in the southern district, Tsunade explained, apologizing to her cousin and glaring at her Sensei. What? yelled Yamamoto angrily, his spiritual pressure quickly covering the room, the entire tower, and well over half of Konoha. This power. I. Can't. Breathe. Hiruzen exclaimed as he grabbed the table in front of him and looked up at Yamamoto's angry eyes. You stupid and disrespectful monkey whelp. You dare to put the future of my clan, which not only helped build this village but is also the Senju's cousin clan, in a lowly apartment complex? In the South District, no less. We both know that area is, at best, a slum and, at worst, the village's unofficial red light district. You have no right to confine Kashina in that area when a cousin like Tsunade is ready to take her in the moment she enters. Even more so when Mito lives nearby and can assist Kashina in adjusting to life in a new village. Yamamoto exclaimed, his rage palpable. Their actions toward Kashina were essentially a trial run on how to control her, which they eventually perfected for use on her son after she died. Please. Yamamoto-sama. This can. Be. Fixed pleaded Hiruzen before feeling even more pressure and hearing several things break in the room as a result. You're damn right, this is correct. Kashina is relocating to the Senju clan's residence to be with Mito and Tsunade. She will learn everything she can about the Uzumaki clan while training to be a Konoha ninja. Not only that, but if the Uzumaki clan requires her return to Uzu, I will not allow anyone to stop her, and will kill anyone who tries. Yamamoto said, giving Hiruzen a, challenge me at your peril, look. You. Can't. It's. Treason. Homura protested before his heart nearly stopped when he noticed Yamamoto's eyes focusing on him. Quiet your tongue. This is not subject to debate, negotiation, or compromise between us. This will happen, or I will kill everyone in this room except Tsunade and let your children rule your clans and positions here. Hopefully, they will outperform the rest of you idiots!" exclaimed Yamamoto, 
with many now fearing the wrath of this old but still terrifying man before the pressure they were feeling dissipated. Tsunade was the only one in the room who was unaffected by it, but that was because Yamamoto wasn't directing it at her. That will not be required, Yamamoto-sama. Hirazin wheezed, Kashina is more than welcome in the Senju clan home, while Yamamoto nodded slightly. Good. If nothing else, I'm going to see my kin, Yamamoto replied before leaving the room, with Tsunade getting up to follow him out. Such strength. I've never experienced anything like it. He is as strong, if not stronger, than the old tales my father told me, Hayuga Hibachi, the father of both Hayuga Hiyashi and Hayuga Hazashi of the Hayuga clan, observed. Indeed. It would be foolish to enrage such a man of such strength, added Aburame Shina, Aburame Shibi's father and, in the future, Aburame Shino's grandfather. He's not a man. It's a beast!" exclaimed a civilian council member, his eyes wide with laughter. A monster we've clearly provoked to the point where he's willing to kill us if we don't give in to his demands. Demands that are not logically unreasonable, Sheena said calmly despite everything. When the Uzumaki clan doesn't get their way, they like to show off their strength. They should be exterminated from the planet. We'd all been better off without them," said the Uchiha clan head, Uchiha Fugaku's father. If you only knew, Hirazan thought, knowing that his plan was now dormant for the time being. Regardless, we must exercise caution around Yamamoto-sama. The last thing we need to do is provoke him into doing something violent, offered Nara Shikaku's father, the Nara clan head. The last thing he or anyone else wanted to see was Konoha put in a difficult situation, or Yamamoto or the Uzumaki clan in general being angry. Along with Yamamoto. It's no surprise Kashina was blinded by love for Konoha. They practically force-fed her no alternative. Yamamoto thought as he reflected on the events of the past. Giving Kashina nothing but the bare necessities to live in Konoha and was basically the only member of the Uzumaki clan left after those in Uzu scattered. When Mido died, Kashina would be all alone with the exception of Tsunade herself, but the Senju could only do so much for her, and Yamamoto suspected Hiruzen had a hand in that. Getting her to form bonds with people who were loyal to Konoha and getting her to be loyal to the only place she thought was a good place to live, Hiruzen, Danzo, Homura, and Kaharu manipulated events on a subconscious level to make the girl rely on Konoha. Yamamoto was determined to prevent this from happening. Starting with a lengthy private conversation with Uzumaki Mito about his concerns about Konoha after ensuring Kashina's safety within the Senju clan compound. So that's it for today. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe to the channel for more awesome stories like this. Thank you. See you all in my next video.